Good morning, I'm David Wessel. I'm director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. And I'm also pleased to be on the advisory committee of the Block Center for Technology and Society at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this is the latest in Carnegie Mellon's AI panel discussion series, which was launched in 2017, before we even knew that what AI was. Uh, the initiative provides a venue for policymakers to get some insights into the key issues, both the positive ones and the problems that artificial intelligence and other transformative technologies may introduce to society in the years to come. It's meant to be a way to start a conversation and to link policymakers in DC to technical experts and thought leaders in academic and industry. So previous uh, episodes of the series have included uh, sessions on the future of work, defense and national security, AI for the public good, and others. Today, we're focusing on critical considerations for building a more resilient and robust US economy in the post COVID-19 era. Uh, this is the first time the event is being held virtually. Usually we hold them in discussions at the Rayburn House office building. So you have to bring your own food this time. Uh, but we hope that this virtual event provides an opportunity for a broader audience to participate in an important discussion. And you know, one of the advantages of, uh, of the terrible period in which we're living is that people are, more people are, will, are able to participate in these conversations than if we have them as a physical space. Um, we have uh, over 85 attendees at this point. Uh, I do want to note that the event is on the record and it's being recorded. Um, if you'd like to pose a question, you should use the button at the bottom of your Zoom app that says Q&A. Post it there. We'll try to get to it during the open Q&A session towards the end of the panel or if some comes up while we're talking. Um, I think uh, also I'm sure that all the speakers would be happy to uh, communicate with you offline if we don't get to your question. Um, our plan today is to start with an introduction by Congresswoman Susie Lee, who I'll introduce in a minute, and then we'll turn to a panel that I'll introduce following her remarks. Uh, Congresswoman Lee is a first term Democratic member of Congress from Nevada, representing the third district in the southern part of the state, south of Las Vegas. <clears throat> Although she is financially comfortable today and has been an active philanthropist and organizer of nonprofits, uh, mostly aimed at children, she grew up in Canton, Ohio, one of eight children in a family without health insurance. Uh, according to her official bio, she got her first job delivering newspapers at age eight. Uh, she put herself through college working as a caregiver, a cafeteria worker, and aerobics instructor. And it is relevant to today's conversation that she has a bachelor's degree in policy and management, which she got from Carnegie Mellon in 1989, and a master's degree in public policy and management from Heinz College, Carnegie Mellon, which she got in 1990. In the House, uh, Congresswoman Lee is on the Committee on Education and Labor and the Veterans Affairs Committee, where she's chairing the Subcommittee on Technology Modernization, uh, fixing everything that's wrong with electronic health records. And Congresswoman, <laughs> after you do that, the VA, I'd like to introduce her to my doctor's office and my insurance company. Um, she comes to us today just having one uh, a primary against two challengers for the Democratic nomination. She got 83% of the vote. So uh, either you're doing something right or you're running a bunch against a couple of losers. Um, <laughs> she has a tough race in coming up in 2020. She won the district by nine percentage points in 2018, but it's a district that Donald Trump won in 2016. So with that, uh, Congressman Lee, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you for having this. Uh, this is such an important conversation to be having uh, at this time. I think it's uh, smart of us to be thinking about the future of our economy uh, because things are going to be drastically changed as we evolve from coronavirus. Uh, as you said, I represent Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada uh, area, Henderson. I'm like the southern ring around the city, so a lot of my constituents are employees of hotel casinos and the hospitality industry. And Nevada has been extremely hard hit uh, by coronavirus. Our governor, Governor Steve Sisolak, on March 17th made a decision to shut down all non-essential businesses in our state. And being a state that relies primarily upon travel and tourism and hospitality, uh, we have seen economic devastation as a result of that decision. 
Uh, the good point, the good news is, is that we did not see an incredible spike in cases or deaths. I think we've had like uh, 458 deaths and, and uh, you know, those are incredibly tragic and I mourn for the families uh, of those victims of coronavirus. And um, honestly, I think that our country would have been better suited had we gotten out in front on testing a lot sooner. And in my opinion, we're still way behind on that. And uh, we can talk about that in the future later on today. Uh, but Oxford Economics ranks Nevada as the second most economically vulnerable state due to our over-reliance on tra travel and tourism. Uh, in May, we reported a nearly 33% uh, unemployment rate, uh, which is the highest in the nation. Uh, and just this week, our state officials have announced over a billion dollars in budget cuts uh, to our state budget. Uh, that's a state budget of a, a little, just a little over $4 billion. So we're looking at almost a 25% uh, cut across the board. The governor is asking employees to uh, furlough, to work a shortened work week. Uh, there are going to be some layoffs of state employees as well. So uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, Congress on March 6th passed the $8.3 billion supplemental funding bill. And that was really, um, when you think back to March 6th, it was so early in this, uh, in this journey with coronavirus. Uh, we, it was really about supporting R&D of vaccine, uh, public health preparedness, investing in PPE and medical supplies and other emergency measures. We then followed it up eight days later uh, with the Families First Act, which was really Congress's response to the massive layoffs and furloughs we were going to experience across the country. And this is the first time that Congress voted to provide paid family leave, uh, food assistance, an, an increase in the federal match for Medicaid, uh, and made coronavirus testing free. Now, remember at that time, we didn't really have that you know, widespread testing. So uh, we have been really playing catch up with respect to testing all along. And then we followed that up on less than two weeks later with the CARES Act, which uh, provided $2 trillion in much needed economic relief, including, but not limited to aid to state and local governments. Um, and, and that was really targeted to COVID related costs. So states were not allowed to use this money to recoup lost revenues. It was really what they were expending, trying to keep up with the COVID uh, costs. Uh, we extended and expanded unemployment benefits, direct stimulant payments, and the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program that was intended to protect small businesses and their employees, and finally relief for hospitals. And then uh, Congress came back on April 24th and passed an interim bill to continue to boost the PPP Act and make some much needed changes to that, which were really directed to getting funding directly to your mom and pop businesses uh, that, were, uh, that were affected by a coronavirus. And then finally, we just passed the HEROES Act out of the House, which really to me is the next step of what we need to do. $3 trillion for state and local funding. Uh, and uh, three, well, it's a $3 trillion package, a trillion dollars for state and local fundings continuing to invest in testing and contact tracing and a host of much other uh, needed uh, measures. Uh, much, you know, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, the first several packages, we came together in a bipartisan manner rather quickly for Congress and uh, approve these packages. The HEROES Act, I think, is gonna be a much tougher lift uh, for us, especially given, uh, you know, the basically Mitch McConnell not moving on this package at all, not planning to move on it until after the 4th of July. Uh, and so this is, um, you know, this is a incredibly uh, scary time in our country. I think what we're seeing with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, has one been a long overdue. Uh, the response that we've gotten now, Congress is working on the Justice and Police Act, uh, which we plan on voting on by the end of uh, of the uh, 
of the month. But ultimately, it was a culmination of seeing the racial disparity, uh, not only in uh, the impact of coronavirus in terms of infection and death, uh, but all uh, on our black community, but also the disproportionate impact of the economic fallout of that as well. So we definitely have our work cut out for us. I look forward to having this conversation today, uh, you know, looking forward to uh, using AI, using our resources, technology uh, for contact tracing, but also thinking about what the future of work will look like and how we need to be pre preparing for that. So thank you for having me. I look forward to participating. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, I wanna uh, remind everybody that if you wanna pose a question, you can use the Q&A box and we've tested it and it actually works, uh, which is always reassuring. So our plan is as follows. We have four exceptionally well-qualified people to talk about this question of how AI and other technologies can help us get through this difficult period and get to the other side. Uh, uh, Ramaya Krishnan is the Dean of the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon and a Professor of Management Science and Information Systems. Uh, Tom Mitchell is Founders University Professor in the Machine Learning Department at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. Eric Brynjolfsson is now uh, Director of the Stanford uh, Digital Economy Lab. Uh, he's just joining Stanford from MIT. And Erica Fuchs is Professor of Engineering and Public Policy in the Engineering School at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and what we're gonna do is ask each of them to speak briefly that's always hard on Zoom. I, you, I'm not a host, so I can't cut their mics off. They'll have to be self-disciplined. Um, we've asked each of them to speak briefly with one example of some short-term uh, concern or issue relating to their specialty in the COVID crisis and one long-term issue. And after they're done, I'll lead a conversation with the entire group, and then we'll be uh, looking for your questions as well. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn the stage over, the virtual stage over to Krishnan. Krishnan, you need to unmute. There you go. Does that work? Can you hear me? Okay, so uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the experience um, at the Block Center, uh, which I, um, and several of my colleagues from Carnegie Mellon today are affiliated with it as well. Over the last three months, we've been focused on um, the COVID response and recovery, working with the state of Pennsylvania, um, and more recently advising uh, leaders of some Asian countries on uh, this topic of response and recovery. And what's been striking has been um, a, a common thread among uh, all the policymakers that we've been talking to, which is a desire for tools that um, really can achieve two policy goals uh, in the near term. First, as reopening is taking place, uh, how can we get as much of the economy uh, reopened as safely as possible? And second, if there is a resurgence, uh, how can there be targeted measures uh, that would allow for targeted closures because there's little appetite among either the citizens or among policymakers to have the kind of entire shutdown uh, of a state or the economy uh, such as what we experienced uh, earlier. Um, and in this, testing and contact tracing, um, the detecting of individuals who are infected and isolating them um, and identifying their contacts um, and determining if, um, if they're infected and isolating them are uh, key elements of the strategy that everybody subscribes to. Uh, however, um, in the absence of prescriptive guidance, uh, there's a tremendous amount of variation uh, across the states and across these different jurisdictions. So for instance, um, yesterday you heard about the significant uh, market correction in response to the fact that um, North Carolina is reporting that uh, they have 87% of the capacity of their ICU beds has is, is already been used up. Uh, Arizona has initiated emergency initiatives with regard to 
adding additional ICU capacity, and Houston is talking about adding field capacity in their NFL uh, football stadiums. Uh, in, uh, in Allegheny County, where, uh, where I live in Pittsburgh, um, the, um, the Allegheny County Health Department is the only agency that's authorized to do contact tracing. Um, but the data required to do testing and answering questions about who should be tested, where should the testing take place, how frequently should the testing take place, should we have a pop-up uh, testing lab at a parking lot or in a neighborhood, which locations are more vulnerable and need uh, testing to take place, or where do the first responders and others that are interacting with vulnerable populations live, should they be uh, tested? All these kinds of questions are the immediate kinds of questions that need answering. And in addition to the fact that no one organization is tasked with doing this, uh, there is a need for data from multiple sectors, from the public sector and from the private sector. So what we are working on is uh, an intelligent testing platform, which is more than just a technology platform. It's really bringing together organizational relationships between the public and the private sector, combined with methods that have been tried and tested in other domains, from political campaigning to marketing, to do the following. To give you a, con to give you a concrete example, if you look at a census tract, uh, you can get data about from insurance companies, health insurance companies, based on um, uh, at the aggregate level of people who have high risk based on past health conditions who actually live there. Uh, you have data from the state, which, are, which has data about the licensed nursing homes that are located in a given census tract. Uh, you have information about the businesses and the age distribution of the, of the population that actually works in, in a given business because the, this disease has a higher likelihood of uh, worse outcomes for people who are older and people with comorbidities. Um, and the Department of Health data as well that's available uh, about uh, the available hospital capacity and um, relevant information that would permit a characterization of the health vulnerability of a, of a census tract, which can then be used by AI techniques um, to target and provide um, very specific decision support about who should be tested. Should they be the vulnerable population? Should it be door to door, um, go and knock on doors and give people tests versus pop-up labs? This is the kind of platform uh, that, that we're creating. Uh, and as I pointed out, it not only draws on data from multiple uh, public and private data sources, and key, the key policy point here is there's a need for a public and private partnership and uh, on, on data, which we have had to cobble together on the fly in response to this crisis. What you would ideally like is to for, to, for this to have been in place in recognition of the need for uh, providing this kind of capacity to provide testing. With regard to contact tracing, my colleague uh, Tom is going to be talking about that, so I'll defer to him on this. Um, a, the, a related point that comes up is if you now add mobility data, this is the kind of data that comes from um, uh, on GPS trajectories about who travels from which census tract to which other census tract. There's data that says 27.4% of the population in the US moves from one county to another county for work purposes. You, there's this commute uh, that people engage in. And that means that you're moving from perhaps a neighborhood or a census tract or a county that might have a higher likelihood of uh, disease to another county that might have a lower likelihood of disease. This is what we are calling commute risk. So this capacity to take into account both um, the health vulnerability of a neighborhood, but then overlay mobility begins to then get at, can we do targeted closures versus statewide or countywide closure, closures should a resurgence uh, happen? The, the, so that's a sort of a near term uh, point I wanted to make. The, the slightly longer term point is the same approach to public private data could also be used for characterizing the economic vulnerability of um, uh, census tracts and, uh, and um, counties. Congresswoman Lee talked about the vulnerability of uh, states based on the nature of the occupations, nature of the industries that uh, 
the engage in. And the idea here is that inevitably there's going to be in the medium term a change in the nature of work itself. And how do we best reskill and upskill uh, our citizens to best be prepared is another area that uh, we can talk about in the discussion session about ways in which the technology can be helpful in scaling up, upskilling, and reskilling. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Tom Mitchell. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Congressman or Congresswoman Lee for uh, helping us put this together and pull it off. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this discussion. The point I want to begin with is really a follow on to what Christian was talking about. Um, as we think about what's really critical to rebooting the economy, it's making sure that the people going back to the work feel like they're safe and indeed are safe. Uh, key to that is the idea of contact tracing. The first point I want to make is that even though we're beginning to do some good things with contact tracing, we could do 10 times better than what we're talking about so far by taking advantage of some very low hanging fruit. Uh, a good start that we've already made is uh, the Google Apple app that's downloadable on your phone that allows phones to detect which other phones are within Bluetooth distance of, of this phone. And if you opt into that service, then if somebody uh, who you were close to turns out to be diagnosed with COVID, then you can be alerted um, automatically at that point in a privacy preserving way. So we have a good uh, start. But if you think about um, what's possible in terms of contact tracing, um, you see that this phone information is just one slice of many kinds of existing data that we could take advantage of. Just think, for example, of the number of credit card transactions that take place in retail every day, millions of transactions. Already, the credit card companies obviously are recording the time, location, amount of those transactions. And that data, therefore, could be used to tell that you checked out right behind me 45 seconds later in the local Starbucks. So there's data that's available. It's already being captured. We need to fold that kind of data into the contact tracing system that we build. Um, another case, airlines. Airlines have passenger lists. They know what seat you're sitting in. They know which person you sat next to on that four hour flight to DC. Um, many, many uh, types of organizations have this kind of information. So we can aggregate that, bring it together in a privacy enhanced way with the Bluetooth um, information. But if you wanna think beyond that, uh, we could easily turn every subway car every restaurant, every doctor's waiting room into a hub for contact tracing for about $200. All we have to do is buy an inexpensive cell phone, put the Google Apple app on that phone and glue it to the ceiling of the subway car. Then just like individuals uh, in contact with individuals are tracked by the Bluetooth app. In this case, the subway car will simply record which individuals were there and when. And in this way, we can, we could easily have a million new contact tracing hubs for about $200 million. So um, I have uh, two recommendations that I would make. One is I think Congress should seriously look into ways of aggregating available private data with the Bluetooth uh, system in a privacy enhancing way. I think Congress should look into the possibility of funding these $200 uh, devices that can turn any physical location 
into a contact tracing hub. Uh, the other recommendation I have has to do with the fact that last night I went to the Apple App Store to download a contact tracing app. There were six, six of them. I don't know which one to use. I don't know whether they're sharing data and there's a lack of leadership in telling, helping uh, citizens who want to opt into these uh, contact tracing services. There's a lack of leadership just letting us know which of these systems we should use and are they in fact sharing data. So Congress and uh, the federal government can do a lot to fill in that missing link. The second point I want to make, I'll, I'll make more briefly because I want to use it to uh, introduce uh, Eric, the next speaker too, um, has to do with some studies that Eric and I have done recently on the impact of AI and automation on the workforce. Uh, one study that we've done recently, for example, looked at uh, the taxonomy of jobs from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and which of those jobs and which tasks that make up those jobs are more amenable to automation by machine learning. The point I wanna make is that as we think about the post COVID world and think about ways in which organizations are going to be restructuring themselves, it seems that this is going to take the trend that was already existing pre COVID of automation impact on the workforce. And it's going to accelerate that. It's going to modify it in a number of ways that we don't yet understand. But for example, um, as organizations put more premium on being able to ship items uh, that are contamination free, that'll put more emphasis on the use of robotics to manipulate those devices. As we think about more video conferences like the one we're having here, video conferences open up a greater opportunity for computers to record and track and today listen in on the conversations that we used to be having in the hallway, but we're now having over the internet. And that trend just in itself of increased observability by computers of the conversations we're having and other kinds of data we're transmitting opens up that will accelerate the use of AI to provide new kinds of assistance. So um, the point there then to boil it down to one sentence. The second point is that we need to re-examine, rethink the ways in which AI and automation are going to impact the workforce as organizations re reorganize and as the workforce starts working more uh, over the net. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Eric Brynjolfsson. Eric. Thanks, Tom. And, uh, and thanks, Congressman Lee, for uh, inviting us. And, and thanks to CMU uh, for uh, kindly inviting me to join this distinguished group of, uh, of experts here. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on some of the things that, that Tom said, but, but let me just step back and say, you know, more broadly, this has been a, a huge tragedy um, over the past few months, um, but it's also been a big opportunity where organizations are, are dramatically changing the way they do work. And I'm going to zoom in on, on two aspects of that, um, remote work and artificial intelligence. Um, companies have changed what they're doing, but this is not something that I think is going to switch back to the way it was before once the pandemic ends. Um, there will be some permanent changes. Uh, economists call this hysteresis when you, when you have an impact and then things, parts of them will continue. I, I think that some of the switch to remote work and some of the use of ma machine learning uh, will persist for quite a while. Um, and, and it brings to mind a quote uh, from about hundred years ago, a revolutionary said that there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks where decades happen. And uh, over the past few weeks, we've certainly been in one of those kinds of periods. So in remote work, there've been a number of articles talking about this and we're obviously experiencing it right now um, a new way of working. Um, the Wall Street Journal and New York Times picked up on, on some research that we've been doing with my team, 
looking at how America is adapting to these new contingencies. And we surveyed about 50,000 uh, uh, Americans. And what we found was that there has been a tremendous shift towards remote work. Um, over half of Americans now uh, updated um, are working remotely. And it was only about one sixth of Americans pre-COVID. So that's about a third have, have switched over. Now, after the uh, pandemic, I'm, I'm sure many people go back to the previous ways of working, but um, talking to CEOs and others, um, they've found that these tools have been unexpectedly effective. I personally have found that the online seminars that we're doing um, work quite well. In many ways, they're more egalitarian. We have about three or four times as many people able to participate. And likewise, uh, some of the executives I've talked to have said that uh, they intend to have people continue working from home. They've pulled their workers and found that for many kinds of work, it works very well. But it doesn't work for all kinds of work. Um, in our uh, research, we found that information workers, not surprisingly, had a much easier time working from home. People work, you know, professionals and, and technical work. Uh, manufacturing and work that involves physical interaction, of course, um, has not been very easy or, or at all able to move remotely. So it's been had very disparate impacts. In fact, workers in those industries were much more likely to become unemployed. Um, we also found, that, uh, not surprisingly, that COVID was really the key driver. Uh, areas that had bigger COVID shocks had more shifts both to remote work and unemployment. Another big change that, that Tom uh, introduced was this uh, use of increased automation. Another way to keep people safe in the workplace and still have output produced is to have machines do more and more of it. And you see this on many dimensions. One that we've zoomed in on particularly is the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence. There's been a tremendous increase, record numbers of downloads as, as companies try to figure out how to do things using automated processes more than they did in the past. Um, and uh, here's the survey that Tom, or that the research that Tom mentioned that he and I did together. Uh, one of the papers was published in Science, one of the American Economic uh, Association. And the starting point is that we're very far from what you could call artificial general intelligence, the idea that uh, machines or AI can do the full width of what humans can do. Instead, it's very good in a few specific areas. And what we set out to do was to understand what are those particular types of tasks that machine learning can do as well or better than humans versus the many other areas, most of them, where humans still have a significant advantage. And then we applied our rubric to the, all the tasks in the economy, 18,000 tasks according to uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics ONET classification. And for every one of those tasks, we scored them on their suitability for machine learning to get a sense of where the impacts would be greatest and where they would be the least. And we found that one way you can look at it is look at different occupations. Here are about 950 occupations. On the horizontal axis is, is how high the pay is on average in that occupation. The vertical axis is uh, how likely they are to be suitable for machine learning, that machines will be able to do these particular tasks using ML techniques. And you can see there's somewhat of a downward slope, which means that low paid tasks like cashiers um, have a lot more um, ability to be done by machines. Anyone who's been to a supermarket lately knows that they not only read uh, barcodes, but they can also recognize the difference between a lemon and an orange and an onion and a cucumber. Um, and so there's a lot of tasks that are suitable for machine learning at that end of the spectrum. But there are also some very high paid jobs. For instance, airline pilot, we found a large percentage of the tasks were suitable for machine learning. In none of them could it run the full, uh, full le length of them. In a, a typical occupation has about 20 to 30 distinct tasks and machine learning can typically do five to 10, sometimes as many as 15 of them. But in no cases did we find that it did all of them. But most occupations, there were significant effects. And of course, I couldn't help peeking to see where economists were. Um, also a number of tasks that are suitable for machine learning there. Um, the effects are quite disparate across different regions of the country. Um, as, as you can imagine, the kind of work that's being done in, in Manhattan or downtown LA is different from the kind of work being done in, in, in Wichita uh, or Cheyenne. So there are a lot of different effects in the country depending on the kinds of work that people mostly do. Um, and we'll see uh, growing uh, differences as machine learning becomes more potent. Um, you can also dive in at the industry level or the uh, company level. There's a lot of different ways of slicing these data. 
Finally, there are a number of interactions between machine learning and remote work um, that will uh, amplify some of the effects. We just finishing up a paper where we use machine learning techniques to analyze 200 million job postings. Um, and we looked at the full text of those for the first time. And now we can understand, um, basically quantify how jobs are related to each other, how close they are in some sort of a, a space of skills and tasks. And we can look at what happens when you add new text, uh, add new skills to a job posting. How does that change the predicted wage and the kinds of uh, uh, classifications that people are, are likely to be in? Uh, if you add Python to a software engineer, then they get reclassified as a data scientist in our, in our example, for instance. Um, you can also look at which tasks are most remotable and which occupations are most remotable. And you get a pretty sensible set of predictions about where you'll see more remote work and where you see less remote work, remote work when you in inject them into this job to vec tool. So to summarize, I'd like to make three main points. The first is that in many ways, the future is already here, that powerful technologies that we need to do this transition in the economy by and large have already been invented and in many cases adopted. Um, in machine learning, the, the core technologies are quite powerful already. Remote work, I think we've all experienced that, uh, at least in my view, they, they've done uh, impressively well. There's certainly been some glitches along the way, but we have an infrastructure uh, that allows people to do many kinds of uh, digital and information work in particular remotely. But the second point is that it's not enough to simply um, overlay new technologies on the old ways of doing business. You have to reinvent and rethink business processes. Business models need to change. And people need new skills and even governments need to update their policies, for instance, on um, not just remote work, but um, what the firm boundaries are, contract workers, how you uh, account for benefits. These are all things that, uh, that our current government policies are out of step on. Um, the changes have certainly accelerated due to the COVID-19 pan uh, pandemic. But if we want to have a more prosperous and more shared prosperity, we're going to have to rethink the way that work is being done. And the right way to do that is to understand now where we want to be in one year, five years, 10 years. Understand what are the skills that are going to be more in demand? What are the skills that are going to be less in demand? How do we want to reshape the workforce? How do we want to reshape our policies so that uh, as trillions of dollars of human capital is laid off and goes out the door, um, when we bring them back, we're bringing them back into a, a more efficient and more uh, equal uh, type of workplace and society. So let me stop there, but I'm looking forward to our questions and discussion afterwards. Okay, thank you, Eric. So times of adversity draw out the best in a nation and also shine new light on our structural challenges. The COVID-19 global pandemic has shown light into dark corners of the US economy. Deep global interdependencies in health and manufacturing, as well as national challenges in racial, geographic, and income inequality and job safety. The good news is that crises offer rare moments in policy for true change, as shown to us by colleague David Hart in his book. I am going to focus in my comments on two areas. The one is manufacturing capabilities, and the second on meaningful jobs for all, and argue that for both, a structural failure in the US's response has been the US's failure to develop strategic decision-making capability on how to act in addition to and beyond market forces. So first, point number one is that to respond effectively to COVID-19 medical supply shortages, is an innovation wasn't and isn't enough. So let me explain why. The bottom up innovation activity, and I am a studier of innovation, so this is, innovation is important, but it's not enough. Bottom up innovation activities such as additively manufactured masks and swabs have been critical, if small, contributions given the lack of under other responses, but they have multiple potential failings. The first is that intermediate inputs rather than final inputs may be our greatest challenge. So in this context, uh, if there is greater global scarcity of meltblown polymers than mask lines, if well-intentioned people are through innovation now manufacturing masks, but those don't have the quality 
or the productivity uh, that mass production would of um, a mass produced mask. We don't really need new masks. We may, there's some interesting innovation possibilities there, but, uh, but what we need is more masks, uh, then we might be actually undermining the global supply of, um, of for example, melt blown polymers. Uh, let me play that out a little bit further. If we are using 3D printing to make masks, we might be using a testarossa to haul wood from the lumber yard rather than a pickup truck. Now I want to be careful here because this varies by uh, context, right? So in testing, we currently have one third false negatives. That's why in Europe you have to get tested twice to make sure that you actually don't currently have COVID-19 when we're talking about current, uh, I'm talking about molecular tests, do you currently have COVID-19 or not with nasopharyngeal swabs? So if 3D printing of nasopharyngeal swabs improves that performance, despite it having a much higher cost of about $2 instead of 40 cents, then that might be a good idea. So this is, this is very complex and requires careful thinking about how we're going to uh, approach these issues. Let me give you another example of how um, we have an issue of uh, intermediate inputs being a problem. I had the great fortune to work with a, a really top-notch medical supply company uh, down south who had the capability to make 9 million masks a month. Uh, these were ASTM level 2 masks. Um, their primary bottleneck was ear elastic, not the melt bone polymer. And indeed, that matched the data that we've been currently bringing together on the global supply chains and in particular the US capabilities in terms of masks, uh, all AS5 ASTM levels and respirators, including respirators, uh, testing, and also ventilator production capabilities. So 204 companies in the US, according to ThomasNet data, are able to manufacture fabric that is melt blown, spun bound, or otherwise. 70 of those, and I'm going to come back to this, meet FDA specs for sure. Um, and again, not all those are necessarily producing for masks. They may be making diapers or uh, shopping bags. Um, in contrast, only eight companies in the United States make no latex elastic. So in trying to help this company uh, connect to someone who could provide them with elastic, I ended up connecting them to a police officer, uh, sorry, a police uniform, uh, a, a company that was a longtime textile, US manufacturer of textiles who made police uniforms, also universal, uh, uniforms for Universal Studios and Disney, who happened to know a lot about local textile uh, manufacturers, including Elastic. Uh, that company, they were having conversations of instead of having someone hand unwind spools of Elastic because that didn't fit exactly into what the machine needed at this company, uh, that they knew somebody who from 30 years ago had in his garage a despooler that could possibly unwind that Elastic faster. Um, so that type of knowledge points out the frailty and the information asymmetries currently in our manufacturing infrastructure. So what do we have there potentially to learn? Uh, from COVID-19, we learned first that critical technologies is, or critical capabilities in the US is not a simple issue. Before we talked about semiconductors, okay, but uh, in our conversations in DCs that making potato chips is not making microelectronic chips, uh, we wouldn't normally think that we need to have any capabilities in manufacturing elastic. Uh, and yet in the complex ecosystems that are required in terms of materials, capabilities, and sk skills to respond to this type of crisis, um, elastic has become important. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that we need to be able to uh, have an ability, a capability in the US to swiftly identify bottlenecks in critical technologies and supply chains and to act in multiple dimensions simultaneously according to those bottlenecks. It has been exceedingly painful to figure out the capacity of various companies. And we are in the process of doing that through multiple angles at once, scraping news, uh, contacting the companies directly. This is a problem that the Defense uh, Logistics Agency and Defense Supply Chains deals with regularly. Uh, but we need to be able to have that capability capability so that we can respond, one, with international diplomacy for our capabilities where we need, but two, so that we can signal to innovators the bottlenecks, where they are, and where innovation is needed uh, and possibly not. So what are the actual problems?
Uh, and that requires also a certain amount of transparency. The second is we need to foster ongoing flexibility and dynamism in products, production equipment, and supply chains through domestic capabilities, internationally distributed capabilities, and domestic and international coordination and diplomatic relations. So that type of dynamism can involve creating new products like masks that can be reused or masks that have a thin film that work in new ways. It can be working on that piece of equipment who could, could only take one type of uh, elastic and figuring out how to get it to have more types of elastic that it could uh, receive, but that requires a technician who knows how to change that equipment um, and people who know that have that knowledge on the production line as well as uh, design engineers or the international flexibility and resilience of supply chains. Those are all options and we should be going at all of them at once. So second, as we look beyond COVID-19, what I want to emphasize is this type of strategic decision-making capability and an analytic capability that we have failed to develop to date in the United States goes beyond to and is applicable as well to our economic recovery in ensuring economic uh, security, national security, and jobs. So even before the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the recession that is sure to follow, I personally believe that to turn around uh, domestic manufacturing capabilities and our situation in jobs was going to require an FDR type investment in infrastructure. Um, and yet that in so infrastructure currently 11% of the US labor force is employed in infrastructure related sectors and estimates have said that um, increasing US infrastructure by 1% of GDP would add 1.5 million jobs, but we need to make those investments smartly. There are enormous synergies. So there are paths to capabilities and to regaining these capabilities in uh, the United States. Um, those paths require, um, so there are enormous synergies between labor requirements, data requirements, and security requirements across transportation, energy, health, and manufacturing infrastructure. We need to be thinking as we make these investments, how do we take the concrete that it should not just be laying concrete, but concrete with sensors in it and the linked data infrastructure to enable machine learning on that concrete? How do we think likewise about how the skills in laying concrete may lay over so that, for example, my doctoral student who went from Berkeley and started a company in solar technologies in Mississippi, uh, but they couldn't, they, they couldn't get the operators uh, going enough and eventually moved to China so that those capabilities, how does our concrete laying develop the capabilities we need here uh, also in testing and also not just COVID testing, but manufacturing uh, product testing. Uh, uh, that we can use these more broadly in the economy, also in data. Uh, so in our own work, we have been doing skill mapping for new technologies, re-implementing the ONET data set at a shop floor level um, and across uh, firms uh, ourselves to try to start to identify how new emerging technologies may have overlaps in skills and also old technologies with skills that we don't have uh, yet here today. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Erica, and thanks to everybody. And we're going to bring everybody uh, back on the screen so you can see everybody. Um, just because I think some people joined late, I want to just reintroduce the people we have. We have, uh, can we go to the gallery view now? Uh, we have uh, Susan Lee, who's a congresswoman from Nevada, 3rd District of Nevada. Uh, Ramaya Krishnan, who's the Dean of the uh, College of Information Systems and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Erica Fuchs, who you just heard, who's a professor of engineering and pol public policy at Carnegie Mellon. Tom Mitchell, who's a professor in machine learning at Carnegie Mellon. And Eric Brynjolfsson, who is not at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and he's no longer at MIT either. He's now at, at Stanford, as you can see from the backdrop. Um, uh, I'm going to, Congressman Lee, I'm going to warn you that I'm going to ask you if you have a question, but I have a couple I want to ask first. That's okay. Um, Tom, there are a number of people who had the same reaction I did to your to the points you made and actually some of the points that Krishnan made, which is, wow, this sounds like a brave new world. We see the potential for technology to help with contact tracing and keeping track of our conversations with AI. But um, are you, how do you ameliorate people's concerns about 
building this massive surveillance capability that might not be dismantled after COVID-19. And when you talk about privacy enhancing ways, what exactly do you mean? Because not all of us are so comfortable about having everybody know everything we're doing. Right, that's, that's really a central question to whether or not we're gonna be able to pull this off. Um, I think the Google Apple system that they've invented is a very good substrate. It's a very good start. And let me just describe very briefly how it maintains privacy. Your cell phone listens for Bluetooth signals from uh, other cell phones. Um, if it gets a Bluetooth signal uh, that it can hear, uh, that cell phone sends it a code, a number. Uh, only that cell phone knows the number and it changes every 15 minutes or 30 minutes, something like that. Um, so the only thing your cell phone knows is that this number uh, was transmitted by a phone that was in close proximity. Um, now, one version of the protocol says that if, um, let's say it was my cell phone, if I end up in the emergency room tomorrow, then I have the opportunity to opt in as a patient who's been diagnosed to let the other cell phones know that that number that they got from my phone is associated with somebody who has COVID-19. So you can see that in this case, uh, much of the data resides locally on the phone and there's no operation done on the data unless there is a need to know. And at the same time, it allows the patient, if for some reason they don't want to do the civic uh, good of warning other people, they still can withhold that. So it's a very uh, cautious kind of protocol. Um, and I think there are technologies that, and I just kind of illustrated one of them, that can uh, guarantee certain kinds of privacy. But beyond that, I think we really need a twofold approach. The other is we do need regulations on what this data can be used for. And I'll just point out that there's an awful lot of personal data that the healthcare system has about us, about me. Um, and we have a system in place where the healthcare system does not share that data with marketing organizations, does not share it with police forces. They simply have the data and they use it for one purpose, healthcare. And I think we need a similar set of regulations that will allow us analogously to build up a data infrastructure for one use, healthcare disease tracking, contact tracing, the one use. And the regulations can be put in place so that um, that data is not shared with other organizations any more than your and my medical record today are shared. So I think we need both the technology to enhance privacy, but also the regulations to guarantee it. Right, but I think you would agree, Tom, that uh, overcoming some public reluctance here is key. And you know, we all we worry that if everybody knows every time we're on a subway car, that someone's going to be able to track our movements, and we may not want the um, immigration authorities to know where I'm going. And so I I I I I know you're you're thoughtful about this. I just think that um, it's uh, it's going to be very difficult to realize the potential of the technology without reassurance, Eric. Well, if I could say something about that, I, I very much share your concerns, but I also want to um, recognize that to a large extent, the cat is out of the bag. I mean, our phone already has Bluetooth. You already are being tracked, David. Um, it's already quite possible for a lot of people, uh, whether they're at the MIT Media Lab or in the National Security Agency or a marketing group, to know a tremendous amount about you. Right now, there are some protocols in place that uh, at least nominally anonymize your information so that you get targeted ads without it being associated with your name. But to be frank, it's not that hard if somebody wanted to, to, to de-anonymize that based on, you know, where you, where you tend to spend your time in the evening and where you tend to spend your time during the day, they can pretty quickly figure out who you are. So in a way, ironically, I think a proposal like Tom's might 
ultimately be a, a path towards stronger privacy safeguards because they would surface it. A lot of people maybe don't realize that, but with this, we'd be forced to confront the reality that there are these put technologies already in place, as I mentioned in my talk. And it's time for us to think very hard, for Congress to think hard, for all of us to think hard. What policies do we want to put in place that uh, do what we can to protect some of the privacy? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask a question, but you don't have to. <laughs> well, actually, I just wanted to pipe in on uh, some of these issues with respect to privacy. Uh, think back to 9-11 when before that we never went through metal detectors to get on an airplane. And following that, we had to give up some of our, our freedoms uh, to do that. And I think that the public is, especially as we look at reopening this economy um, and the possibility that we're going to see a potential another shutdown of the economy, we are going to be faced with that decision. And the public, the public sentiment is going to be faced with the decision. Are we willing to give up a little bit of our freedom so that we can travel freely, get back to work? And there may be a situation where people who don't want to give back up their freedom will be subject to quarantines, whereas those who want to be tracked or allow, you know, you could have a marker or whatever, will have that freedom. I think that that is the decision that we may have to make in the future. Um, you know, it's, it, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, discuss or ask and talk about was with respect to privacy, I mean, this is definitely something with uh, electronic health records, uh, the portability and the transferability, the, what we call the interoperability. So as sir, the Veterans Affairs Committee, for instance, we're developing a, a record where we're communicating with the Department of Defense, but now as the Veterans Affairs relies more on community providers, uh, how we interact with community providers. And the bottom line is who owns the data and how do we regulate the data and who has access to the data. And I think that is an area where Congress has to weigh in because uh, barring any congressional involvement, it will be a long protracted legal uh, fight. Um, I, I guess moving on into questions, I think the thing that I'm contemplating or working with is, you know, as we look to the future of work and, uh, you know, the, the talk of the, uh, the uh, machine workforce versus those who have to actually be uh, physically there and workforce development and investment in education um, you know, the thing that I'm grappling with is how we set our priorities, especially in a time right now when across the board, we are seeing state budgets devastated. And so, for instance, in Las Vegas and Nevada, the move to automation, the move to us as a country realizing that our manufacturing sector needs to be, I'm just going to say reinvigorated, how do we uh, set a policy to direct dollars into the right places at this point when we're seeing this economic devastation. I just think it's a, I don't know if it's more of a question or an observation. Thank you. Um, Eric, it looks like you want to respond. Sure, I can uh, talk to that. I think that um, even without uh, full capabilities of awareness of where all of our capacity is, which I think is growing quickly. Um, in the work that we've done, we have quite a lot of capability in the United States uh, with respect to, I mean, to come back to it, you know, 204 companies that have manufactured fabric that is melt blown or spun bound. Um, that that's a lot, and we also have been looking at the number of companies that are able to make respirators, uh, which is 359. Uh, so I think, in part, this may be a question of better coordination and clearinghouse by the government uh, to say that there's going to be insured purchasing of those capabilities and also sharing of information. Um, 
uh, so encouraging coordination across the firms. You could there could be a clearinghouse uh, where companies, large companies, uh, are able to, without revealing themselves, put information in uh, on uh, what their capacity is. I mean, some of them are being quite public about their failure to meet uh, capacity and, and where those bottlenecks are uh, without um, necessarily having to reveal themselves so that we can both direct innovation in the right direction, but also there are people out there who can possibly help. So again, similar to Tom's comment, we need one place that people are going. There are so many different places. You know, Thomas Net says you can signal you're doing COVID-19 work. Um, America Makes does, which is doing a phenomenal and very interesting job on directing innovation, but doesn't know the bottlenecks of, of um, the large manufacturers. So, uh, so I think this is creating one place and, and bringing the large firms together to signal where the problems are. Christian, so you want to help. Yeah. So, so David, if I might connect the dots between both these comments, I think with regard to the first one on on privacy, th there's another angle with regard to having public-private partnerships around data, which isn't about necessarily data that, um, that Tom uh, specifically addressed. It could also be administrative data that is available from the state, is available from businesses. Um, and this is not only in the healthcare front, it equally well applies to the economic front. And that, I'd like to say a few words about that. I think in, in, the, in the midst of this uh, crisis response, we found that Policymakers wanted real-time situational awareness of what was going on on the ground on both public health as well as economics. And it turned out that their administrative data was not well suited uh, to, to meet the needs of providing that real-time situational awareness. Just to give you an example, on the, um, on the economic front, when you have um, a shutdown order that closes a, a set of industries down, um, you have the set of individuals um, who are employed in that industry uh, potentially getting unemployed. Now, Carnegie Mellon is officially closed, but I'm fully employed because I'm working digitally. A restaurant is, is, uh, is open, but to a large extent has been operating uh, at very low uh, capacity. So figuring out who's actually employed by an industry at the appropriate four-digit NIC code and industry code where do they reside? What's their gender? What's their uh, economic status? Are they on unemployment? And are they benefiting from the CARES Act funding? All of that takes from the time of filing of an unemployment claim to it getting into a warehouse that can actually inform the policymaker it takes six weeks. So if, if I'm in, in March, I'm looking at data from January. If I'm in April, I'm looking at data from March. So it, there's this disconnect. On the other hand, if you look at for those set of people paid by direct deposit by banks, uh, banks have data in near real time. When you lose your job, your direct deposit uh, checks stop, stop flowing into your account. Um, and when you start get, uh, getting paid by unemployment or the CARES Act, they have data about that. Now, if you now take, I'm using this as an example, if you take the bank data, aggregate it up to industry code and county, and integrate that with state level data, it gives a more complete picture than either one could. Um, and so one of the things that is really important is if this was done ahead of time in response to a crisis with some very specific safeguards around what is the data being collected for? How is it to be used? And under what conditions can it be used? Then it doesn't have to be, you're not running around trying to cobble together these coalitions of private and public to support policymakers to get this economic monitoring, health monitoring, and, and forecasting, you have this in place. If you have this in place, it also will address Congresswoman Lee's question about how to understand how is consumer behavior changing, how is consumption changing, because banks uh, have and credit card companies have data about where people are spending and not spending. Um, so these kinds of information combined from public, private, and even civil society and individual sources with safeguards around under what conditions can this be invoked can be used both for the health purposes as well as for the economic purposes. Right. I think that's right. I think it's worth pointing out that some of this is already happening. The Bureau of Economic Analysis, the Federal Reserve are using credit card data 
particularly to look at regional variations. There are lots of issues with it because a lot of this data is not collected for the same purpose that policymakers need it. And there are issues of, of uh, how do you adjust for all sorts of market share issues. But also I wanna plug the Census Bureau, which has moved with enormous uh, agility and is doing now weekly surveys of both households and small businesses that's giving us not the same quality as administrative data, but giving us a lot more information in real time than we've ever had before. Um, Eric, um, somebody asked, and when you describe the workforce of the future, and I think you're absolutely right that there are a lot of uh, things we're gonna automate now, and we're glad to have them automated. Uh, in my neighborhood in Washington, D.C. now, there's these little robots from the co corner store that will deliver a six pack of beer or a loaf of bread. <laughs> um, we don't have to walk six blocks and breathe on somebody. But um, I think that raises two questions and they're not they're not the same, but I'm gonna raise them both. And I'm interested in you and Erica might wanna respond. One of them is from a, a, someone in the audience who basically says, you know, sometimes I like having human contact and just because a job can be automated doesn't mean that we should automate it. Uh, and I think we've all had that experience at an airport when we used to go to airports. Um, you could go to a, a kiosk where you punch in on the little iPad what your order is. It's not the same thing as having a waiter or a waitress. And so there's a taste question and how do you see that? And then secondly, I think it's a question of how well equipped are we to uh, upskill and educate people whose jobs are gonna be even faster at risk now than they were uh, before COVID. So two questions, one about taste and one about what's the public policy way of equipping the workforce for the world you envision? Yeah, no, those are great questions. I think it was Mary Ellen Benedict who asked that first question. And um, it, it's very much uh, in, the, in the rubric of what Tom and I were working on in terms of what sorts of tasks, um, ones that involve human contact and human interaction are ones that often you, you don't want to automate. And in the case of, of uh, waiters or, or people in other uh, occupations, um, we found, well, actually for every occupation, we found that, that machine learning didn't run the whole lift, list of them. There were parts of them that you want to separate. So one of the challenges for entrepreneurs, managers, is to think about how we redesign, reorganize a lot of different jobs so that we keep parts of them that we want to be done by humans, even as other parts are automated. Very rarely is it an all or nothing, you know, this job is all automated and this other job is, is untouched. In the case of waiters, I actually I had some great conversations with uh, 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 Mr. Berkowitz who runs uh, Legal Seafoods in, in Kendall Square next to MIT. Uh, they introduced these kiosks for all of their tables. And then after about nine months, he pulled them all out. He said that the, uh, the um, customer, even though it was more efficient and it was faster, the customers really, as you said, liked the having a person come and talk to them. And, and there was a social aspect that we shouldn't uh, uh, ignore. And there are other times, personally, I, like when I go to the airport, I prefer having the robot kiosk print out my uh, ticket and just do it more quickly and efficiently. So I think it depends on the transaction. That one I don't need, need human uh, interaction for. And, and different people have different opinions. This is exactly what we, what we need to uh, understand. In terms of the skills, um, I think what we need is a roadmap, like we're trying to create, of what are the kinds of skills that will be more valuable, more needed going forward, what will be less valuable. And to oversimplify a bit, uh, there are a couple of big categories that um, will be, I think, continued for a long time to be very important. One is, as you touched, as you pointed out, the human touch, personal interaction, you know, whether you're a kindergarten school teacher or a coach or a, a salesperson trying to persuade somebody or, or some of these other professions, it, it's very important to have human interaction. Uh, when, you, when someone's explaining a diagnosis to you, you probably don't want a robot to tell you whether you have cancer or not. Um, and, and then there's another big category, one that maybe economists have overemphasized that involve a lot of uh, creative work, uh, discovery, thinking outside the box. Machines so far are not very good at many of those kinds of tasks. So in, in scientific discovery, entrepreneurship, art, many other areas, there's uh, a, an important need for humans. So those are two of the added areas, but, but this is a, an important research agenda. And as I said in my talk, as we, as we work our way through COVID, we shouldn't just look at the short term, okay, you know, who do we need to hire or lay off this month? But we should be thinking about the, the economy on the other side that will have a lot more of these technologies in place. And I think for many years, decades, 
a tremendous demand for, for many kinds of human skills. What about on the question of, oh, Eric, let me just follow up with one thing yeah, there. And then I'd like to answer. Yeah, yeah please. Um, so if you were advising Congresswoman Lee and her colleagues uh, about what sorts of investments they should make or reforms to the way we educate and train people, what would be a couple of things on your list? Well, we need a complete rethinking of the way education is done. It's designed, frankly, in my view, for sort of Henry Ford's era, getting people to sit quietly in rows of desks, follow instructions, uh, not be too creative, be all in sync with each other. Great for working on an assembly line, uh, maybe important for 19th and 20th century technology, but almost the exact opposite of what we need today, where machines are very good at doing rote, repetitive work, good at memorizing facts, repeatable information. And what we need actually is a lot more creative work, a lot more interpersonal skills, a lot more teamwork. Um, so um, at, at many universities, I know at MIT and, and elsewhere, but and, and increasingly in, in K through 12, we have people working on projects, we have people interacting, working in teams, trying to ask the right questions, not just use a formula to answer the questions once they've already been posed. But that's a very different kind of education than I think we've been uh, investing in in the past. So ultimately, it, it's, you know, most economists, maybe because we teach in universities, we put at or at the near the top of our list of things to, to make our economy more productive is education, but it's not simply doing more of the same, not simply pouring more trillions of dollars into what we've already been doing. It's also a reinvention of education. Thank you. Erica? Yeah. Um, so three things in response to that question and uh, building on Eric's comments uh, and differentiating slightly in certain areas. So the first is, uh, and there are also some other questions that talk about, you know, what do we need for economic recovery? I, I want to emphasize again that there are in some cases simple answers that might get us a long way. Uh, so for example, why are Iceland and uh, Japan doing so well? Uh, is it because of the contact tracing in Iceland that was done by a detective? And you know, I'm not saying that's simple, uh, but you know, could it be done with a combination of contact tracing and everyone 100% uh, compliance on mask wearing. And those masks might be cotton masks. They might be ASTM level one masks. We're not talking about everyone wearing N95s. Uh, so I just want to emphasize that innovation is, we may not need those robots down the street if we just all wore masks, <laughs> right? So that's one. Uh, the second is, um, and, and Atul Gawande actually talks quite compelling about these, that topic. Um, the, uh, the second is that on where we would want personal contact uh, and the concept of waitresses, right now I would not want under COVID-19 uh, personal contact with a waitress uh, or waiter, um, but that might change uh, post-COVID-19, which there will be a post-COVID-19. Uh, but what I want to emphasize where I do want humans is to be involved in certain aspects of manufacturing. So in advanced materials and processes, when we don't understand the underlying relationships between inputs and outputs, repeatedly in my work over the past uh, two decades, we see that it is people, both the operators and the technicians and the um, uh, engineers interacting on the production line that helps figure out why when we put the same buttons on the machine and the same inputs in, we got a different thing on day one than we did on day two. Was it that Mary put something on top of the machine or was it that it was more humid outside or, or what that was about? And that is a critical aspect of scientific discovery and technology commercialization. So for us to remain at the technical frontier in physical products that are advanced materials and products, uh, that, that's going to be a critical um, skill, and we do need people there. Um, so uh, the second is that on this public policy for workforce to upskill, I also want to emphasize that our work uh, and my work with Christoph Kambamal, Lawrence Ailes, and Katie Whitefoot suggests that it's not all about upskilling. Also a recent paper that um, we are, a working paper that we have with Chad Severson and Katie Whitefoot and Ria Laurasius, uh, same thing. Uh, so here, what we're seeing is that certain uh, new technologies like advanced materials and processes, which get rid of parts and make it all as a single uniform 
thing. Uh, so that is advanced microprocessors, but that also is, for example, turning your iPhone or your watch into fewer parts that are all monolithically fabricated and, and a flexible electronic polymer. Those are actually entailing convergence of skills, even at the operator level, rather than upscaling. Um, so I want to sort of note that there are still a variety of skills required in the economy and thinking about uh, mapping, as Eric said, uh, what skills we need and how to support investing in that full ecosystem is going to be critical. I think both Tom and Krishnan wanted to weigh in here. So Tom first and then Krishnan. Okay. Uh, just a quick point. I think uh, with respect to this question of what can we do policy-wise uh, to help workers prepare for the future, OECD has an interesting effort, which is still in the early stages, but you can go to the OECD website and you can see a survey of data. You can explore this data about skills supply and demand across OECD countries. And for example, there you can see, and so can any worker, that there's a surplus of mathematically skilled people in Romania and a shortage in the Netherlands of those people. So you can see where there are physical displacements. We could get that data in the US too if we put our mind to it. Um, second, in the same OECD website, you can see that uh, job A and job B are close enough that if you can do A, you can learn with a reasonable effort to do B. So for example, if you are an electrician already, you have many of the skills needed to become a welder. And there is a short path uh, in training from one to the other. So I think those kinds of uh, data collection and then making that information directly available to the workforce uh, is one thing that we could do. Thank you, Krishnan. Yeah, a, a couple of follow-up points. Um, the, the first is, you know, to the point about roadmap that Eric pointed out, uh, one could also turn to organizations that have a, their year to the ground. Take unions, uh, and they, they've had a, a long history of, um, you know, the uh, supporting the trades, and they have a, uh, the AFL-CIO is a future of work initiative. Um, Walmart has a really interesting Walmart um, university initiative for training their associates in a range of skills. And the way they arrive at what skills are relevant is based on the businesses that they're in and the set of ecosystem of partners that they're interacting with. So I think uh, this question of the roadmap and what should that roadmap be and how should one be very agile about figuring out what the skills should be, we could also look to organizations to figure out what potentially those skills might be. The, the, the second uh, point is individual, it's great to tell individuals that they have to be upskilled or reskilled, somebody has to pay for it. Um, so the question is, should there be the equivalent of uh, individual training accounts that allow for individuals to pay for uh, their upskilling and reskilling? Uh, and there have been a number of interesting proposals, both in Congress, but then some examples of uh, what's happened in Denmark and France, where you earn credits uh, up to a particular amount uh, that you could use not for retirement, but towards uh, education. On the business side, I think there's been interest in businesses being able to get a, the equivalent of a tax break for investing in human capital. We have heard about you know, Amazon and um, other large companies investing in their human capital. Um, so the question is, should there be some incentive for uh, firms to invest in their human capital? And could there be a change in the tax law in that regard? And then the last point is, how do we actually deliver education at scale? And uh, two of my colleagues, Ken Kehringer and Lee Brandsetter at the Block Center have actually been working on how to use uh, some of the uh, technologies that Ken has developed to try and deliver learning uh, at scale with um, learning outcomes uh, that, are, uh, that you can actually know for sure that you've actually delivered on. So I think it's a mix of things. It's not any one thing. It's about knowing what the skills are that are going to be in demand from organizations and then the various in, incenting individuals, incenting businesses, and then figuring out also the technology uh, to be able to deliver the scaling at scale. 
Okay, I have two very specific questions, one for Krishnan and one for Tom, and then I want to ask something else. But Krishnan, someone wants to know, the app you referred to, when will it be ready and is it solely for Allegheny County or is it other jurisdictions? Uh, the, the platform? Uh, no, the, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the methods in and of themselves are not specific to Allegheny County. The, the bigger challenge is getting the, the data from these different organizations to come together in such a way that we can actually use it. And we are in the process of cobbling that together. And Tom, uh, your idea about putting a cheap cell phone in every subway car, um, uh, the, the questioner says, it's all off the shelf technology, but how long do you think it would take to actually deploy it and use it? I think subway cars would be the hardest because of theft, but uh, restaurants, Starbucks, right. uh, anything where you can put a phone in the ceiling, you're fine. I think honestly, the app is already, uh, the app is already ready. Right. And so the installation cost really is a matter of buying a cheap cell phone, downloading the app from the Apple or Google store. And um, what one thing that we would need to do is um, right now the app is set up so that if person A's phone, uh, if person A gets sick, it contacts the other phones it's in touch with. So we need um, to put in place an infrastructure so that if A and B were in the same Starbucks at the same time, but not close enough for their phones to touch, um, then we'd have to have a little bit of software to link those together. That's right. pretty straightforward. Um, so we have about a little bit less than 10 minutes left. And I, a number of people have raised questions that basically touch in different ways on about inequality. Uh, we know we have a big gap in our society between winners and losers between those people who are able to work at home and those who are forced to go to work and maybe putting themselves at risk and those people who can't work and all that. Um, but a couple of issues came up on this. So one is very simple. In the world in which uh, we're talking, it seems to me uh, that universal broadband is almost essential. If kids aren't going to go to school and they're going to do it remotely, we really don't want to have people sitting outside the library on a stoop with a cell phone trying to do their calculus. Um, but secondly, it also comes up with questions about data that to the extent that we're gathering data from bank accounts and credit cards, uh, do we run the risk that we're not getting a full picture of the society because we're not reaching those people who don't use them? Uh, just my editorial add to that. It seems to me cell phones are doing pretty good at being universal, that there are a lot of probably more people with cell phones than credit cards and bank accounts. Um, but does anybody want to talk a little bit about uh, the ways in which technology can be an obstacle to reducing inequality or uh, a way to, to solve the problems of inequality? Oh my God, I'm gonna to have to answer my own question. Um, Erica. I'll start to, to give uh, Eric and uh, Tom more time. Um, so obviously what I will speak to is manufacturing. Um, our work in the NBR paper we recently had come out shows that, um, unsurprising to DC, there are more high school educated workers in manufacturing and uh, they earn on average better wages. Uh, and also that, um, that that is complex because uh, in comparison to our R&D uh, spending in manufacturing, which is 66% of um, US R&D, industrial R&D spending is in manufacturing, only 12.4% of our manufacturing value added uh, is, is here in the United States. Uh, so that is due to, uh, in part, the greatest, there's a number of measurement issues, but the greatest contribution to that that we could find is uh, the relocation of manufacturing overseas. Um, I don't think that that globalization of manufacturing by itself is a challenging thing, uh, but there are jobs that are relatively good jobs if the right safety is put in place. Uh, we do have some of the highest occupational fatalities despite our reduced amount of uh, manufacturing here in the United States. So I think one is manufacturing and two is 
smart strategic investment in infrastructure uh, and the development of this broader ecosystem. Uh, we need to have jobs and there are jobs that would help us innovate uh, if we invested in them uh, correctly. So I was actually speaking in response to the first time. I, I think I've, I have to uh, I get double muted or something like that. So, uh, so, um, so two, two quick points, um, uh, David. Um, I think the first uh, point is that with regard to uh, technology and inequality, I think the, both the points you made are great ones. Um, in addition to that, the, uh, the same project that I mentioned uh, about what Ken and Lee, Ken Kadinger and Lee Branstetter, their focus is actually on um, 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 uh, citizens who are disadvantaged, who might not have um, uh, more than a high school education or a GED, and providing them uh, the skills required uh, to be able to um, participate in jobs that might doesn't require a college education, but would allow them to get the appropriate skill sets. And there, I think it's really important that both the funding exists, but funding exists to create skills and training for which jobs exist. So this partnership between the private sector and the training that's offered so that there is both a demand pool and the capacity to uh, connect the two, because oftentimes you end up with training for, you're giving training, but there is the, the training then gives people skills for which there's no demand. So how do we connect th those two? I think that's a, that's a really important piece. Um, and this is actually work that's ongoing um, in Pittsburgh. They've also sort of reached out to um, uh, work with school districts School district in Chicago as well as in Pittsburgh. So earlier in the pipeline, if you will, to provide students with uh, appropriate support. So that is one point. The second and a, and a different aspect which COVID has caused is, um, for instance, in in Pennsylvania, um, the uptake of SNAP and uh, assistance to needy families and Medicaid hasn't hasn't significantly gone up uh, in the crisis. And one of the questions that's being asked is why is that the case? Is it the case that people need to be educated, people who have typically not used those services, who have now are uh, out of a job, do they need uh, uh, to be educated about the potential services that are available? So I think there's both uh, on both sides, one in terms of skilling, but also in terms of social services and the kind of support uh, that uh, the public sector could provide, technology could play a, a, an important role. Right. Um, uh, unless someone has something I want to add, I think it, we've reached uh, the appointed hour. I think we've covered a lot of turf. Uh, I think the advantage of a conversation like this is that there are different nuggets about things, about everything from global supply chains and the importance that we have some capacity to make elastic in the United States to uh, how to use uh, cell phone technology efficiently for the, um, for the, to, deal with a COVID crisis, to thinking about how do we organize our society to get the best that technology offers while limiting the downsides and, and making sure we're weighing uh, the trade-offs well. Um, I think any conversation like this is a success if there's more questions than we get to, and there are several we didn't get to, and for that, I apologize. Um, and as I said, I'm sure the people at Carnegie Mellon or any of the speakers would be happy to engage on specific questions. Uh, Carnegie Mellon will, I'm told, be announcing follow-on discussions in the near future, and we'll keep people posted when future events are released. Um, uh, there were more than 100 people listening in for the entire thing, and some in addition who came in and out. Uh, everybody who registered for the roundtable will receive an email in the next 24 hours with a link to a recording of this roundtable, so you can play it over dinner for your family as well as a white paper that uh, uh, captures the essence of this discussion. Um, on behalf of CMU, I'd like to thank uh, Erica, Tom, Krishna, and Eric, and Congresswoman Lee for joining us, and for all the people who ask good questions, and not the least for the tech support people at Carnegie Mellon, uh, George Zarakos, and the others who, Brian Yeski, who seem to have pulled this off without any of those embarrassing glitches to which we've all become unfortunately familiar.
Krishna, you want to have a yes. minute? I just want to take a moment to um, uh, thank Congresswoman Lee again for uh, convening us. And David, thank you uh, for uh, moderating and uh, making this a very exciting and interesting dialogue for us all. Thank you very much. All right. Everybody should and take care. Congresswoman. Thank you. Yes, I just want to say um, this has been an incredibly, I'm just going to say, enlightening. It's one of those things where you have to go spend an hour just thinking you're reorganizing your thoughts after you have this conversation. Um, I, you know, I took away great nuggets from each one of the presenters. So thank you all for uh, what you have done and your, what you continue to study and, and write about and inform uh, policymakers. Um, you know, it's really an incredibly important time right now. Uh, in politics, there's a saying, never waste a good crisis. And, uh, you know, and I think that this conversation is so important as we start to look at the HEROES Act and how we're going to put investments into, you know, right now we're just pumping its CPR for the economy. But, and I think that that to, is such the frustration with politics and, and policy is that we're thinking on such a short term time frame, but many of these societal changes need to involve a long term plan. And so as I think about legislation that we're working on, I'm going to hop off of this and hop on an Ed and Labor uh, committee uh, meeting is how can we start to lay, I'm just going to say the building blocks, um, you know, it obviously rethinking education in today's society will require monumental change uh, and you know we have the higher ed act that we are trying to reauthorize which i don't think we're ever we're going to get to this year um, but as we do that how can we start to think about um, the type of change that we need and the innovation and in education that we need and begin to put that into those pieces of legislation. So I've left this with a lot to think about. Um, I'm excited that Carnegie Mellon, uh, first of all, the work that's done at CMU is just to me incredible. And I think that um, I've always been, I've always drawn on my experience at CMU of using data and empirical processes to inform our policy decisions. And I think that um, the innovation and the thought that you all provide to the policy conversation, but more importantly, to us actually getting it into policy is so important. So thank you all for the work you do. Thanks for uh, joining me today. Uh, this has really been incredible. And I hope this is obviously not the end of the conversation and we continue to work together. Well, thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman. Thank you for sticking with us for the whole thing. I told everybody at the beginning, well, she'll make her remarks and disappear. So <laughs> no, this has been great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have a good okay. one. Take care, everyone. Bye.